That's a very important, yes. Um, the way, what, what happens here is that there might be, for example, a certain kind of atomic decay process. And what this decay process will produce is two particles that might go off very, very fast from one another, but they do have a common origin. That's right. And that common origin is what got them into this entangled state in the first place. So, yeah, it's not, you can't just have, and that's actually a very good point, a very good question. There's no way to just sort of arbitrarily pick a particle here and pick a particle here and wave a quantum the magic wand and get them entangled. Um, there's got to be something in their history that allows for the entanglement to be created. There are, there are fancy things called entanglement swappings, where I can have two entangled particles that are entangled as part of their history, and then a third particle, and there are fancy operations that I can do that will swap what's entangled with what, but still, Common origins are part of the story. Absolutely. Good question, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, all right. I'm trying to get this straight here. Uh -huh. uh, unlike the definiteness hypothesis, mm -hmm. or uh, was it uh, uh, classical quantum mechanics, uh, there is in fact, there does in fact to be, you know, appear to be some, I don't know whether you would call it spooky action at a distance, but some action at a distance that we don't know. I'll give you a different word for that in a minute. Well, maybe, here, here, is, here is the situation uh, in a nutshell. There are some, let's use the word correlations, yeah. some seemingly yeah. spooky correlations, puzzling correlations that when we try to build a kind of a classical model for them, we fail. Okay? Now the question is, how do we understand these correlations? How do we think about them? And on some theories, yeah. theories that are beyond our capacity to test now, there actually is some kind of uncontrollable faster than light interaction. We can't control it, but it's there. On other ways of looking at it, there's a lovely phrase that the physicist Abner Shimoni came up with, and it's this. He said, there is not action at the distance, it's passion at the distance. <laughs> and the idea was that there's a, there is some kind of relationship between these two particles that is not anything that was contemplated by classical physics, but calling it action at a distance is not right, he would say, we really need a new category of relationship. And that's another view that some people take, and, you know, people will have disagreements about which is the better view. But, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, is it, would it be accurate to say that the, the second view comprises the idea that, that the, uh, the two particles, that, that they're not really, that they're not com two completely separate systems? Uh, yeah, that's... That, that that's even, though, yeah. even though in some <coughs> ways yes. they may appear yeah. to be, that there yeah. are some... Some that's actually right. That still that's actually away. right. Yeah, one, one way that I sometimes like to point is if you go way back to the ancient Greek atomists, and you go back to the 17th century when modern science was emerging, uh, the view that people had about what would be a really nifty way to build a universe, because it would be so intelligible, was you build a universe out of little bits of hard matter, and they've got shape, and they've got hardness, and they move around and bash into one another and get hooked together. And the thought was, boy, if you could build a universe out of stuff like that, it would be really clear. You've got these distinct, well-defined things. And they're atomic in that sense, not just in the sense of being uncuttable, but being these discrete, separable things. Well, quantum mechanics seems to ask us to give that picture up. When you have entanglement, it seems that in some sense or another, and there's a lot of discussion about how this should be spelled out, these two things aren't just two completely distinct things. This is why the word holism has made its way into serious discussion and not just into popular discussion. There's something funny here. The quantum is not the classical. I think this is related. Tell me if it's related. Can you relate the concept of non-locality mm -hmm. both on a popular 
and on a quantum, uh, in a quantum context. Mm -hmm. We encountered yeah. it. How does understand the, how those two interact, both the popular, the mystical, yeah. and, the, and the quantum? Yeah, I think um, it's probably something like this, and, and I think that some people in the physics community are, are guilty of using language a bit carelessly here. The word non-locality seems inevitably to suggest to many people that what I do here actually affects things over there. That my manipulation stuff in my part of the lab is actually causally influencing stuff over there. But that's exactly what the controversy is about. That's exactly what people in the foundations of physics don't entirely agree about, is whether that's the best way to understand these phenomena. And so the more careful sense of the word non-local here would be one that says something more like this. There are correlations here that cannot be accounted for by classical models. Whether those correlations bespeak some kind of literal <coughs> influence is a much more delicate matter that's much more controversial. So I think that's the difference. Popularly, one thinks of it as, I do something over there and it changes the electron over there. The careful physicist or the careful philosopher of physics would say, yeah, not so fast, that's not so clear. Thanks. Yeah. I don't know, you might want to describe this, the, uh, the hidden variable theories, because you sort of alluded to that, that there's some other property yeah. inside these yeah. things yeah. when yeah. they split yeah. that you read when yeah. you do the experiment. That's exactly right. Yeah, if you use the term hidden variable theory, the definiteness hypothesis would be a case of a hidden variable theory. It would say, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen are right, there's something missing from, uh, you know, quantum theory itself, the something missing we'll call hidden variables, and if we understood those things, we'd understand how the world works. One kind of hidden variable view says, look, it's just like the analogy I used uh, a few minutes ago. I make a letter, I give you a copy, and I give this gentleman a copy. And it's no surprise that when he looks at his letter, he knows what yours says. Okay, that's the kind of view that the EPR might have. There are other hidden variable views that say, yeah, there is more stuff there, but we still got action at a distance. So the so-called Bohmian mechanics view of quantum mechanics, named after the physicist David Bohm, um, is a very serious research program that has you know, a lot of interesting work going on in it. And it does say that at some level there's some kind of action at a distance going on. But it's outside our control. And the theory guarantees it will remain outside our control. So we still can't use it for telepathy, for signaling, for getting information without classical means from you. Um, and then other people say, ditch hidden variables, they, don't, they aren't necessary, there are other ways of looking at the theory. You have to give up the urge to think that all the correlations have to have a mechanical explanation. Yeah. Yes, sir? I, I, I don't know if scientists, others are accused often of using jargon. Mm -hmm. Maybe the problem is sort of the opposite. Uh -huh. If you weren't using a word like entanglement, yes. people wouldn't confuse it. I mean, I, I think part of the problem is that you're using words which have a very technical, specific meaning, and people are taking them as common English words. Well, actually, what happened here historically with this, with this word entanglement is kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> what happened was that when Einstein, Pedalski, and Lewis wrote their paper back around 35, Schrodinger himself, who also had many worries about quantum mechanics, looked at this work and did some, uh, did, did some work of his own, and he is the one who introduced the word entanglement into the discussion. Um, my German is failing me at the moment. I can't bring the German word to mind, but it's one that can't translate very naturally as entanglement. And he didn't define it in a technical way. What bothered Schrodinger was it seemed to him that quantum mechanics did involve precisely some kind of spooky action at a distance. That it seemed that way to Schrodinger. It seemed to Schrodinger that by doing stuff here, I could at least with some probability <laughs> steer the system over there into any state I liked. He called this remote steering. He has a couple of fascinating papers about this. And so the word entanglement entered the discussion not as a technical term, but as, Sch as Schrodinger's expression of his bewilderment about this apparent feature of quantum mechanics, and Schrodinger said, 
I hope it isn't true. I mean, he said, my hypothesis is that as soon as two particles start to move apart, the entanglement will decay and disappear. And that turns out not to be true. But, yeah, I mean, the, the vocabulary can be confusing, but it was an expression of puzzlement about the theory itself. <laughs>